What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today we have with us Michelle Dickinson, author of Breaking Into My Life. Today's topic is mental health. It's going to be a good one. Three, two, one. Let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs Podcast or DMGH Podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step at a time with your host, Chris. Hello, Dickinson. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, I read your book, absolutely loved it. Um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book and how you kind of journeyed to this point? Sure, sure. Thanks for asking. So I grew up with my mom who was bipolar and I had always uh, wanted to share that story. I I knew it was uh, as I got older, I realized that it wasn't normal. My childhood itself was different, um, but I didn't really have the courage to write the book until I was older and I had gone through some healing. So I just wanted to share what that experience was like, largely um, for my own healing journey, but also in an effort to humanize the experience of loving someone with a mental illness because. You know, so many people don't know what that's like. And when they hear mental illness, they shy away from it. So I thought if I could tell my story, then maybe it could also be a contribution around um, re removing the stigma. And what was it like to come to the decision to write a book about your personal life? Yeah, it's interesting because I wanted to write the story, but didn't have the courage. Uh, I was invited to speak at the um, my company's TED stage about my story. And when I stood on that stage and, and had the courage to tell it, the reception that I got from telling my story just like confirmed for me that I needed to write the book. It's just mm -hmm. an idea I had in my mind. Um, and then that kind of propelled me forward to beginning to write the book. And are you hesitant at all to um, kind of give people a sneak peek of your life? Oh, absolutely. It's an incredibly vulnerable space to be when you start to story tell and start to really divulge um, some of the, not so much of the experience, but the implications and the results of those experiences and how that shaped me as a woman. So, and to do it in front of my colleagues, in the workplace, <laughs> this was like even more terrifying. But I said, you know, at the end of the day, the first thing we all are is, you know, we're all human and yeah. then we're employees. So I thought if I could, if I could uh, help, you know, make it more of a human experience at work, yeah. I wanted to. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit before the interview, uh, but I was curious as to, after reading your book, at what point did you really realize that your mother was going through um, certain mental illnesses? Was it when, uh, if I had to guess, I would say maybe when your cousins moved in, they started to notice the transition or when was that? Yeah, it was probably four or five when my mom started acting like pretty different compared to what I knew her to be. Uh, she was very nervous. She seemed very stressed. She seemed very aggressive and very, um, everything needed to be in its place. Um, a little, a little obsessive compulsive about how things were in the house, which was not the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, so probably like when I was four or five and then like, I think she had her first, when she was, you know, put into the hospital because of her the severity of her bipolar, probably like, gosh, when I was like seven or eight, and then I had to visit her there. So, yeah. yeah. And at what point did you notice that your life was a little bit different than everyone else's? You know, it's funny. It, it is, it became my norm. So I didn't know any better, any different until I would go to my girlfriend's house and like be around them and their mother and their father and just yeah. see what different experience that was. And I was like, <laughs> it, there's no heavy vibe. It's kind of <laughs> fun. They're smiling. It's relaxed. They're just kind of enjoying life. And, and life was very hard and very like, um, it was always stressful. It was always like taking the temperature of the room, trying to figure out, you know, what mood was she in? 
And it wasn't like that at my girlfriend's houses. And I got to see what a mother daughter relationship looked like compared to mine. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So one reason why I really wanted to bring you on was that in the legal industry, there is um, a lot of mental illness and stress and depression and um, not only things that are caused by genetics, but things caused by the high stress environment. Uh, Also, law school. Uh, Law school has a really high rate of depression. um, And in the legal field, there's a lot of drug abuse and also depression. And there's also a very high suicide rate as well. What would you say to attorneys and law students that can't really run away from or shy away from these stresses and they kind of have to uh, face it uh, head on, I guess? Um, Because you 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 spoke about in your book a little bit how uh, you try to kind of get farther from your mother to kind of catch a little bit of a break from that experience. Uh, For attorneys and law students, that's almost impossible. So what would you say to a person coming to you with this? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's so easy to, you know, downplay how you're feeling and think that you need to muscle through it and just be tough. You can kind of power through. But I think the biggest risk with that is that you then try to navigate it in isolation and you're, you're very separate from having a conversation about it. And, oh, you know, you might be afraid to talk about it because you'll be perceived as being weak or whatever. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you're feeling like it's compromising your joy and, you know, you can't get away from, you know, just that balance that you once realized, like you have to talk about it because talking about it in some regard, whether it's to a therapist, maybe you're not comfortable with that. You Maybe it's finding a confidant to talk to. You have to keep talking about it because it's when you like go into isolation to try to navigate it yourself that you, it could just spiral out of control very quickly. Yeah. Um, I actually spoke to a friend that is going through some problems. And after kind of talking to him about uh, not only your book, but uh, different kind of articles I read about this, uh, a lot of people agree that if you see a monster under the bed in this situation, you need to look under your bed. And you need yeah. to see what causes it, you know, and also the understanding that it's not your fault that you're feeling the way you are. Yes. Um, so why do you think people fear mental illness? Well, I mean, just to your last point, it's there's like this, this the shame and the fear, right? So the fear of, oh, gosh, you know, I'm going to be judged by society because we're still not in a stigma free environment. So it's the fear of being judged. It's the fear of what does that mean for me? Is that what kind of treatment is that for me? Like I, you know, in my mom, my mom's case, you know, having bipolar, she was afraid of the side effects of drugs and didn't want to take the drugs. Mm -hmm. But treatment is so much better now. And, you know, there's so much it's so much better for, for people struggling. So I think it's fear. And I think it's, um, you know, it's this embarrassment, you know, we, we aren't, we aren't yet in a society where it's common to talk openly about mental health. You know, I think that we have so much work to do to start to relate to brain health, like we would any other organ. Yeah. You know, if we needed additional support, like kidney support, liver support, whatever, we would we would raise our hand and say, Get, I need additional support right now. And we wouldn't have any shame in asking for it. Mm-hmm. So I think it is also, you know, the shame and the fear that those are the two largest things. I think that people, um, you know, that's what keeps them silent. And that's a shame. It is. I, I said this before where mental health uh... – when you talk about mental health, a lot of people see in the negative, but mental health is like physical health. It's just, it's just, it's, it is what it is. If you're unhealthy or healthy, you still have health, right? It's the same thing as mental health and physical health. Uh, so what would you say to someone that kind of wants to talk to their friend about their mental health, but doesn't want to offend that person? What do you mean by offend? Uh, I guess sometimes people feel awkward asking like, hey, buddy, you know, like, like, how are you doing? I noticed you're acting a little bit differently. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I follow. So yeah, it is. It's as basic as are you okay? But then it's also as basic as, you know, creating relatedness. I I once struggle with feeling like completely overwhelmed, or I had anxiety, or I ha- I I remember being in that space where it was like overwhelming. It's creating an opening to have the other person feel comfortable. And like an invitation to share if they want to, not like pinpointing it them yeah. and go, you know, are you mentally ill? Like, no, it's like, like life is going to give us blows. Events are going to happen in our lives, you know, from a death in the family to stress because you're in school, whatever it is, you're human. 
And I think, you know, we can all do a better job of creating a safe space for people to feel more comfortable, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. judgment free zone, just easy, easy to uh, just be with whatever the person's dealing with. Uh, are there any other ways that we could have kind of de- destigmatize mental health and this topic? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's the more common we make conversations around it, um, the less of a thing it'll be. So I think it is more conversation, more um, open discussions about resources that are available. I mean, I think there there are so many great resources available people can go to to learn like the biggest question i get is how do i know if i'm suffering from depression it's like if you go to the nami site the um the nami website they have a checklist so you can assess you know is this compromising this this and this okay well maybe it is so maybe i do need to get help so self-awareness i think is important um but i think you and i like the average person has the ability to um, create that warm and inviting space where it's not awkward for your friend if they're struggling, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that it, it we can de- destigmatize this by having, you know, one conversation that's judgment-free at a time. Yeah. Why is it tougher to find articles and help for mental health and other illnesses? I don't know. I mean, I think... I think we've done a better job. I think, you know, if you were to look back when my mom was struggling, gosh, like it was really hard to to learn about it. I mean, even my own father didn't know uh, enough about my mother's disease. Um, I think we've come a long way. And I, I think, you know, there's more resources than you might be aware of out there. Like there's a lot of nonprofits doing great work to remove stigma, um, mental illness, you know, institutions and non and you know organizations like I mentioned NAMI so I think we're getting there and I think um you know the internet provides a great a great library of resources so I think I think it's a progression but I think we're moving in the right direction I've heard before people kind of talk about how they don't need a therapist because what they're going through isn't extreme what would you say regarding that so if it compromises your joy in any way you need to talk about it with someone and it might not be a therapist. It just might be with someone. Um, but that's the problem is people don't know how severe it is and they just go, Oh, well, I don't know if I should tap into that, into that, you know, kind of care. It's like, what do you have to lose by just exploring, you know, having a conversation to really understand what the assessment is of you, you have nothing to lose. So why not take advantage if you have the ability to do that? So how did you kind of react when the book was was written? I mean, you must have felt relieved that you you poured this information out to the world and you felt like, did you feel lighter? Yeah, so it was four years, four long cathartic years of writing this book. So when it was finally <laughs> done, it was like, sweet victory, it's, it's finished. But then actually, that's when I got really connected to, I could leverage my story and my book to cause more conversations. And that got me even more charged up. So while it was a relief to, to kind of put it out there and share my story and really, you know, dig deep to get there. Um, it also, you know, has propelled me into my passion, which is causing change and really like making a difference. And, you know, my little story is one story, but if my story causes you to talk about mental health, then, then it's all worth it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one issue I find a lot in law school is that people connect their value to their grades and to their jobs and to their income. And from my internship and different work experiences, I found that same exact thing happens to attorneys. Uh, and, it seems like kind of they're on the treadmill with, you know, like a hot dog, you know, dangling over them and they never reach their goals of and ha- and feel like relieved and happy. Uh, so what would you say to someone kind of going through that? It's like in the rat race, they just can't seem to finish. Yeah. So they're, they're striving for success. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, some of the greatest lessons, cause you know, I, I didn't just get arrive at the, the point where I was healed and I'm going to write my book. I did a lot of self-discovery work. So I did, you know, a lot of landmark work. And then I also did a lot of Tony Robbins work. And one of the things that Tony says that I like, I will always remember, and I believe is so true, is that you have to have success with fulfillment to have that beautiful life that you want. So you can be targeting that success as much as you want, you know, going for 
whatever accomplishments you need to kind of reach that level of success. But if you don't have a component of fulfillment, something that's really feeding you and feeding your heart and feeding your soul, Mm -hmm. it's not going to feel like you're balanced. So you always need to have that, that other thing that is giving you that fulfillment so that you have both. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say if, if you're, you know, so focused on the success piece, you're missing a huge element of the joy that you can have in your life by finding whatever whatever it is that's going to bring you fulfillment, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, being part of a nonprofit or giving in some way or, you know, doing something that makes your heart sing. For me, it's pottery. But doing something that brings you great joy, you should have, you know, making the time for. And I, I'm not an attorney. I didn't go through law school, so I don't know how much the free time is, but you have to have some outlet. You do. I definitely agree. I think that during your first week of law school, you're told whatever hobby you have, it's done. Like, don't do it anymore. And I feel like they do it on purpose, right? To try to get you into the mindset where it's time to really handle your responsibilities and and take life by the horns. Uh, But when taken too literally, I feel like that could really cause people to, I I guess, lose the flavor for life. Uh, Because the law is great. The law is fun. and, And I can't believe I'm saying the law is fun, <laughs> but, but, uh, people need a hobby, right? They need something to make them feel like they're on this earth for a reason. And a lot of times attorneys, their passion isn't the law, right? That's one of their masks. Yeah. Um, but they actually need something be- um, bigger. Um, I saw online you, you run a program for, for kids, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, created through my other healing, uh, work that I've done. I created a, a program for children to realize their greatness, which was, it came directly from my own, um, absent mother and not hearing from her, you know, you're capable of whatever you want, et cetera. So I created this program called perfect, just the way you are. And I, I gave it to my company, Johnson and Johnson, and we've been running it now for several years. And the goal is to, um, target underserved communities and really help kids get that whatever they are, whatever they dream to aspire to have, they could if they just work hard. And it's also a, a vehicle to teach them how to nourish their body and also how to nourish their mind um, and leadership skills. So the, it's a really, um, really amazing program, but it all comes from what I was lacking as a child. So it also feeds me to be able to give to them. Yeah. And how so. common do you think mental illness is within the communities now? I do think it's common. I think, um, you know, I think when you look at stress and you look at anxiety and you look at, you know, trauma that's happening in schools with, you know, the shootings and things, I think that it's more common than we talk about. And I think we, you know, there, there are vices that mask it in terms of like coping with it. So I think, um, I think it's common. And I, I also recognize and appreciate, you know, more of the mindful conversations that are going on, the mindfulness and, you know, making sure people um, are doing what they, what they need to proactively for their, for their mental well-being. Um, So it's kind of like, I see the good and then I also see the reality. Um, But I think the biggest opportunity we have are our youth, right? So last year in 2018, the CDC released statistics, which are terrifying, Mm -hmm. um, that that suicide is the third leading cause of death in our youth from ages 10 to 24. So like, that's huge. We have to do a better job empowering and teaching our youth, you know, what to do when it comes to being responsible for their own mental well-being. Yeah. Um, and, And set them up for college and high, you know, high school, college and whatever. Yeah. And I think I saw that report. I think that there's more suic- uh, deaths due to suicide than car crashes in the last yeah. couple of years, which is really yeah. alarming. It really is. And it's it's like it's growing at a rapid pace. And and when you see that it's specifically for, you know, the statistics for our youth, it's like we have got to do a better job of yeah. teaching them. Yeah. And talking about it. Right. Here's an opportunity. It's not like our generation where we have to like shift people away from stigma. We have an opportunity to mold and to shape kids and how they actually relate to brain health and their own well being. We can shape it versus course correct. Yeah. You know, just by talking to them openly about it. Yeah. And it's pretty shocking too when you look at the numbers and the details regarding those studies. You would naturally think that it's uh, people kind of on the fringes that are feeling are, are mostly dealing with mental illness, but the most people who kill themselves are actually, I think the report said, um, older 
white males in America. So pretty much like the people you never would think would uh, yeah. would be suffering mostly from this. So, I mean, you can't run away from mental illness. If it's something you're dealing with, you got to face it head on because yeah. no one's safe from, from this type of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think too, we, we need to do a better job in the workplace. I mean, let's look at the workplace and like, you know, how many times people go into corporate environment like I'm in and like put the mask on and pretend yeah. they don't have this invisible disability, but yet they're struggling. So I think we need to do a better job in the workplace and having everyone be able to bring, you know, all of themselves to work and yeah. not, you know, have them feel less than because they're struggling with a, some yeah. type of mental illness. Well, also the workplace needs to start taking responsibility as well for this. I mean, mental yeah. illness doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Yeah, there are some genetic links, but a lot of times you feel depressed because of your surroundings, where you are. I mean, if you're in the office 24-7, uh, just surrounded by artificial light, never go outside. You can never go with the, out with your family and have a nice, you know, uh, four-day trip because the the, the, interest, the law, legal industry is so busy. I mean, you, your workplace needs to start taking responsibility also for the health of their employees. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at the the, the numbers around um, disability, I think depression is one of the most expensive um, disabilities, and um, you know has the greatest impact on on the work environment. So yeah. it's like there's there's multi reasons why we need to do a better job taking care of employees and giving them what they need to feel like you know they can be the best version of themselves. Yeah, I definitely agree. If uh, anyone wants to get into contact with you or learn more about you and your path and your journey, what would you recommend they do? Sure. You can go to my website, which is uh, www.breakingintomylife.com. Um, you can shoot me a message there. You could read a free excerpt from the book um, or, you know, you can just go on to Amazon and buy the book as well. It's, it's available. Great. Uh, and do you have any last words for any law students and attorneys out there that are, uh, are going through some things? <laughs> Yeah, don't just don't think that you got to tough it out yourself. I mean, there are resources, there are, you know, treatments out there, there's, you know, different um, options that weren't available when my mother was dealing. So don't feel like you got to muscle through it alone. Consider that if you get support for your brain and for, you know, your well being, that you'll actually be able to thrive and do a much better job, you know, reaching for your goals. Fantastic. So. Thank you also for joining us. I was really happy when I got your email saying you'd do it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, but I hope to have you back soon and continue the fight uh, to destigmatize mental illness. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Morning, What's up, guys? I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, leave five stars and written review on Apple Podcasts. You can also check me out on SoundCloud, YouTube, and Google Play Podcast. As always, it's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Broken glass, the weight of rain and even skies.